For a passage of scripture that deals with encountering, it deals with Acts chapter 26 when Paul is defending himself with Agrippa. And he says, who are you, Lord? Telling this testimony, I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus. For I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future. Did you see? Did you hear how clear that word was that we want to see Jesus and be encountered by Jesus? And Jesus will tell us things that will be in the future. So seeing has to be something that we desire and go after. Like in Second Kings, verse chapter six, verse 17, when the prophet Elisha prayed, he says, Elisha prayed, oh, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes of the young man and he saw that the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. We want to be able to encounter, we want to be able to see, and we want to be able to expect the unexpected. A way to say this is simply, Christine Kane calls it this, unexpected is what God does. Praise the Lord. Today, I want to make sure we recall a few things. We always try to start our services and messages off to increase our faith with what is God doing? And today I've titled it, What the Goodness of God is Doing. There is a very, very close lady that has uh, been a part of my nurturing and growing up years. And yeah, you could even say she was like my aunt. And she had keys to our home and everything. And um, as surely she is um, a senior saint today, but um, she had, con had contracted um, the coronavirus virus. And, and I just want you to know that in the midst of it, she was taken to the hospital, her and her husband. Um, her husband was on quarantine and you know they're not letting people in hospitals and things like that. But the short part of the story is, is I understand as, that this week they even said that they gave him a call and asked him to come to the hospital in order because there was nothing else that they could do. I'll say that again. The medical staff said, we don't believe there's anything else we can do. And he went and he entered into the room and they did certain tests and picked up her arm and fell back down, called upon her name or asked her, um, her to squeeze his finger. And she didn't do that. And right at the end, they said um, she he whispered her name and and she responded to that. He looked at the doctor and said, I want you to put all of the things in place that you're supposed to have back over her. Because even though there might be where you stopped, but that doesn't mean God stopped. Oh, glory to Jesus. I want to skip to where we're at today. I just got a report that a few days after that, they told her, told the, the husband to come back again, came back. And when he walked into the hospital room, she said, hey, honey, she called him by name. She was no longer comatose and she was no longer out. She was no longer non-responsive, but she was responding. And she was already weakened and compromised because she is in need of a kidney. Oh my God, that's what God is doing. But I don't want to be insensitive to those that have lost life, but we had our own very, very vulnerable woman of God. And I'll omit her name, but she was at one o'clock in the morning and two o'clock in the morning and she was texting her fever was rising and it got as high as 301.1. And again, a very compromised, uh, you know, health. And then we prayed with her by text and the word of the Lord came and said, by the time we wake up in the morning, this will be normal. And when the eight o'clock hour came and when the text came back, it said 96.7. That's what God is doing and what he'll do for one. He'll do for you and he'll do for your family, too. Thanks be unto Jesus. I'll close about one that's here in Iowa. You all may have seen the young man that he's 68 years old. 
in Cedar Rapids. They came into the hospital in Cedar Rapids 23 days ago, critical condition in the ICU unit, and he walked away either yesterday or Friday. He walked out, they lined up the halls, and he walked out and he carried his cane. Thanks be unto Jesus. That's what God is doing because of his goodness. And that's good. That's just good for us to thank God. That's what God celebrates is his goodness. The question is how the Holy Spirit is. We want you in today's word to, to know how the Holy Spirit is comforting for those that have lost lost ones. God is comforting and consoling and leading the greatest global compassion. And compassion is mercy or what we call mercy strategies in our lifetime. It is beautiful to see all of these corporations and artists and companies and, you know, beautiful how even like O'Fallon or all of those people are doing things out of their homes and causing the guests to want to give donations. We are seen all over the globe. Even medical people collaborating that they we might be able to conquer this because God is causing people's heart to be turned toward tenderness, not toward selfishness. We're seeing what could be called a greatest compassion in our lifetime and continuing to the contending of through our prayers for lives to be saved. We want to contend that Jesus Christ would save lives. Jesus is the son of David, meaning he fulfilled the Messianic promise. He is the Messiah, which also is the word Greek word Christ and is the English word anointed one. And this is why we preached the word of God last week about him being the fulfillment of those prophecies. And if Jesus, not if, because Jesus is the fulfillment of those prophecies, we know that he is the son of God, son of man, son of David, to bring about all of the fulfillment of what we need for the kingdom of God. I want you to remember sozo. Everybody say it with me, sozo. Sozo is to be saved, healed, delivered. These three messages of unexpected encounters, last week was who is this? This week is anointed for tunnel vision deliverance, Next week is for a vision of what 2020 faith can do for you. I want you to remember this in the heart or in the back of your mind. Make a note, God's deliverance. We are looking for the unexpected. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Turn your Bibles today to 2 Samuel chapter 5. We are going to, as we promised, to go further in understanding how we spoke about Jesus, the son of David, and then we came back and looked at David in what he named his sons. But now we're actually going to look at that passage from verses 1 to 16. So 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 to 16. I might not know how to pronounce a few of the names or words. It says this, then I'm reading from the New Living Translation today. It says, then all the tribes of Israel went to David of Hebron and told him, we are your own flesh and blood. In the past, when Saul was our king, you were the one who really led the forces of Israel. And the Lord told you, you will be the shepherd of my people Israel. You will be Israel's leader. So there at Hebron, King David made a covenant before the Lord with all the elders of Israel. And they anointed him of they anointed him king of Israel. Verse four, David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 40 years in all. He reigned over Judah from Hebron from seven years and six months. And from Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. Verse six says, David then led his men to where? Jerusalem to fight against the Jebusites, the original inhabitants of the land who were living there. The Jebusites taunted David saying, you'll never get in here. 
Even the blind and the lame could keep you out, for the Jebusites thought they were safe. But David captured the fortress of Zion, which is now called the city of David. And on the day of the attack, David said to his troops, I hate those lame and blind Jebusites. Whoever attacks them should strike by going into the city through, come on, read it with me, the water tunnel. That is the origin of the saying, the blind and the lame may not enter the house. So David made the fortress his home and he called it the city of David. He extended the city, starting at the supporting terraces and working inward. And David became more and more powerful because the Lord God of heaven's armies was with him. Then King Hiram of Tyre sent messengers to David along with the cedar timber and carpenters and the stonemasons and they built David a palace. And David realized that the Lord had confirmed him as king over Israel and had blessed his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. In other words, God blessed him for the sake of his people. Verse 13 says, after moving from Hebron to Jerusalem, you want to catch that, David married more concubines and wives, and they had more sons and daughters. These are the names of David's sons who were born in Jerusalem. Shem Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elush Elushah, Nephged, Jeph Jephia, Elishama, El Eliad, Eliada, and Eliphalet. And everybody said, Amen. I want us to take a look at this particular passages of scripture in your notes, if you will, I'd like to share with you why we want to show you why this is called anointed for tunnel vision deliverance. I want to share with you why this is called anointed tunnel vision deliverance. Isn't this a beautiful uh, picture and this particular, maybe a surfer of some sort. And as that swirl is made a tunnel and, and at the end of it, you could even say it's a light at the end of the tunnel. And, and what we want to do is the anointed tunnel vision for deliverance. We want to go through a few of these scriptures as we study. Like, for instance, take a look at your notes. It says, here are the verse phrases for our faith, for our faith. Like in verse one, it says, all the tribes of Israel went to David at Hebron. So when we talk about these three points, I want to show you about anointing or him being anointed. First of all, the word Hebron means association. And the point I want to make, just a small little point, is that when they were at Hebron, you know, there's a very difference between just having an association. So the tribes were already divided, Judah and the rest of Israel. And so now they meet here at the capital of Judah at that time, which was going to be Hebron. And so they meet at Hebron. But Hebron was just that they got together, but they weren't acting as though they were close. They were just associated with one another. And where anointing works and most powerful is not where we just are here together because after whatever we're doing is done, we are separated and gone our own ways. So there was an association. Look at verse three, it says, so there at Hebron, at the association, King David made a covenant, a covenant before the Lord with all the elders of Israel. And they what anointed him king over all of Israel. So another point about anointing is that anointing deals with agreement because it says they had a covenant before the Lord with the elders of Israel. When we talk about anointed, we're talking about first association. Second, we're talking about agreement. But then look what it says. It says that they, that it says later in like verse five, and he reigned. Do you everybody see that? It says, and in verse five, he reigned over Judah from Hebron for seven years and six months. And for Jerusalem, he reigned over all of Israel and Judah for 33 years. The third point I want to bring out to your attention is that reigned deals with authority. So when we talk about being anointed, and I want to make sure I don't 
can't use extra time that we're not just simply talking about King David, but we are also talking about these are the things we see in Jesus is that they anointed King David. This is his third anointing. And therefore, he's anointed there at association. He's there and he's anointed where there is agreement because anointing the presence of the Holy Spirit falls on agreement like they were in the upper room, all 120 praying on one accord, because wherever there is agreement, God's presence falls where there is agreement. If we could come into agreement, God would manifest himself every single time. And then it says authority. You see, he called this anointing had him to have authority. He was anointed first and he went back out to the sheep for what was going to be a future need to walk in that anointing, slaying the giant or whatever else it may have been. But then there was anointing of when he came over the rulership of Judah. But this is the third anointing, the anointing now to be over all of Israel. And we know Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit over all of his kingdom. And let's go a little bit further. In verse six, it says, David then led his men to Jerusalem. The key word here is Jerusalem. The word means city of peace is one definition. But I also want you to know and to write this down. It also means teaching of peace, not just city of peace, but teaching of peace. When you break down the etymology of the word, also Jerusalem, it means to shoot an arrow or to shoot or to cast, to cast what? Peace to do so. David's first mission as new king was to go and conquer Jerusalem. And the reason is, is because when he was king and over just Judah, his capital was Hebron association. But now that he was going to be over all of Israel, he goes to the place that he knows would be a great spot in order to have rule over all of Israel, both Judah and Israel, all 12 tribes. And that would be at Jerusalem, where the city of peace or where the teaching of peace. Why? Because what we have and what God wants us to live in is the peace of God. That's why Jesus is the prince of peace. That's why God prophetically and profoundly had us begin the whole year before COVID-19 ever struck and we began to separate in March in the middle of March, God just concluded and then we had to deal with it. But we've already had embedded in us that we need to walk and live and move in Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the peace giver, that we would not have anxiety, that we would not walk in fear or worry or what would be, but we would live in peace. That is the representation of Jerusalem. And then in verse seven, it says, but David captured the fortress of Zion, which is now called the city of David. You see in Jerusalem now that he had captured it. I want you to see that in verse seven. Once it was conquered and captured, he took it and he gave the name city of David. And Zion was there, but Zion means parched place. But he named the city. It's an exchange and especially prophetically the word Zion, meaning lots of things related to us and the church, as well as the people of God of Israel. And then in verse number six, jump back to verse six. I want you to catch this phrase. So I've just talked about anointed. I've just talked about Jerusalem. I want to talk about Jebusites. You want you, you want this. It says, but David captured this fortress of, Z oh, I'm sorry, verse six, to fight against the Jebusites, the original inhabitants of the land who were living there. I want you to understand, and especially your notes, that the Jebusites represent an enemy. The Jebusites represent an enemy. You know, it's the descendants of Jabus, which was the third son of Canaan. And we know the Canaanites were enemies, arch enemies of the children of Israel, or you could say the people of God. We no longer fight against flesh and blood, though, but we want you to know how are we supposed to handle an enemy? You see, 
They held the land for a long standing time. I want you to hear that. I mean, for 300 years that they were in the rule and it was not to the people of God, even though we might know it today, but historically and biblically and especially understand that the children of God not only did not have Jerusalem, but it was possessed 300 years on lockdown with their arch enemy, with the enemy, has what should be theirs, is that given to them. And it was that way even through Jeru through uh, the book of Genesis. So if we understand that, let me make sure I check a few of these notes. When we talk about this, David wants to do the impossible. So what did he want to do? He wanted to take on Jerusalem so he could have it to be united. He knew that it was the Canaanite people from the tribe of Jebusites. Heavily, it was a heavily fortified city that could not be conquered. It, and what they were going to do was going to come from the south where Hebron was. And let's go ahead and take a look at some more of those notes real quickly. It says 300 years and the threshing place, the name Jebusite means threshing place. You don't want to miss that. It's the threshing place where they would, you know, winnow uh, the grain and the things like that. Separate it out, filter it out. Don't forget that. In verse six, again, on the chart that you have there, it says the Jebusites taunted David saying, another point, you'll never get in here. Another point, even the blind and the lame could keep you out. Another point of the enemy. For the Jebusites, the enemy, thought they were safe. I want to speak to us today, and I hope you're bearing and learning, because I'm prayerfully preaching today. I know these past two weeks I was hooping, hollering, and shouting, but but let me let me try to work in some good teaching. Think about what the Jebusites were doing, and think about what the enemy does to our lives. He's taunting him. They were taunting them. They were putting them down. Telling them what they could not be, could not do, and you'll never get up here. I tell you what, the devil has got to stop. You know, some of those sayings that not today, devil, but to this taunting was, I want you to look at the notes. It says where the devil, anytime you want to know what's going on in your life, look at these. This is how you know the devil has been there is because anything that is dead, stolen, destroyed, confusion. You know, he comes to steal, kill and destroy. But anything that's confusing, he God's not the author of that lies, lies. The, the devil's the father of it. Accusations. The book of Revelation. He stands there accusing. If you got accusations, that's of the enemy bound. The devil is always behind trying to bind someone like he's bound and going to be bound in hell. You know, deals with our will, always trying to lock our emotions, our mind and our dis our will, our volition down. And he does it with lies. He's the father of lies. We cannot buy into the devil's lies. Somebody say amen. Why? Because then it goes on to say mocking. And I drew a strikeout where it says spirits, because oftentimes we can trace the devil because some things that we get bound, captured or in captivity to is not even because we can't get out or because we weren't once free. It's because it left a door open sometimes that an enemy has come in and we find ourselves now bound by some spirit that's influencing us. No, we will not be possessed as believers, but the enemies and the spirits behind the enemies can cause things in our lives to be bound. Yeah, you might have victory in most of your life, but there might be this two areas that you just feel trapped in and maybe it's a secret thing. And I know that we can have victories in nine areas, but if God came to make us whole, then we ought not have that one area still where we can't get over it or can't get through it. Thanks be unto Jesus. Jesus paid for all of us, not just part of us. So if I go back here, it says that the verse eight, I hate those lame and blind Jebusites. That's what David said. This was an idiom. The word here is an idiom. That is the origin of the saying, the blind and the lame may not enter the house. Why? Because the idiom statement comes historically from the Jebusites. So they're just putting it out there. But even in historical scholars say that they not just said it, 
But they actually put the lame out there. And we don't know because it's traditional thinking. But but they say that there's a potential that the Jebusites put their lame and and their their blind out there to taunt them and to mock them like you can't even do it. I'll talk about why that was real at that particular time. But here's the point. You see, David goes ahead and uses it as well. He was not being mean when he says, I hate those lame and blind Jebusites like those that are marginalized or oppressed or something like that. No, it was a name for those in whom you disliked. So therefore, he uses it as well. But notice last week I spoke about when Jesus cleared out the temple, when Jesus cleared out the temple, what happened was, did you remember that? I don't want you to miss that. Even the lame and the blind came into the temple and the Bible says, and Jesus healed them. You see, there were laws and there were things that all people, if they were harmed or blemished or or maybe the people that really need God the most are the ones that feel like they can't even get in the doors or they won't be accepted or they want to be held in the back or they didn't have the right clothes. They didn't have the right smell. They didn't have they came in and they didn't have a place to be. But in the scriptures, Jesus cacked out all of the money changers and those that were selling and buying and then the lame. And the blind came in and the Bible says, and Jesus healed them all. Everyone heals when Jesus is touching them. I want to further say in verse eight, whoever attacks them should strike by going into the city through. Go ahead and say it again with me. The water tunnel. Here's the point. The word we want to look at is the word David. This was a tunnel vision. First of all, historical. I have lots of truths and facts and scholarly and archaeological understandings of these things. And I want to be able to kind of put some of those things aside and recognize we're reading it and believing it because Jesus or the word of the Lord has given it to us in his word. David says, whoever is going to do this, we've learned this in first chronicles. Uh, chapter 11, I believe it is, and like verses four to six. And we see this account where Joab, Joab, one of his men in the troops, <clears throat> he takes him up on this offer. He says, if we're going to conquer this city, Jerusalem, if we're going to come against this fortified place, I want you to think about the region and the topography. They were looking up and the walls were way high, at least 10 stories up, not to mention the landscape that they would have had to cross. It's kind of like the game we used to play called, you know, King of the Hill. Well, they were on a hill. So any kind of way that you would try to get up to win, they would never get in. So David had a tunnel vision and he said, you know what? I... I'm saying you're going to have to take the water tunnels. And there's lots of historical points about tunnels or springs. And we don't know. It's so many that were built underneath Jerusalem that there are some that were dated back before during Genesis. And some happened while the Jebusites were there and inhabiting it. And so there's all kinds of things. But the one on the south or where the Gihon Spring, where the fresh water came into the city, there was a fortress there. And David's man, Joab, he took the offer. Oh, I don't think you understand. This is what he did. Now, this wouldn't be a tunnel what they did, but he took the method of going through. And he and it and it wasn't low, right? It, it wasn't low. It, it was high. And they say he had to scale the wall to get up it. Are you with me? And if he had to do that stories of 13 feet or 22 feet, whatever he had to do. Don't miss the end of this word. (laughs) He did whatever he had to do because he went into Jerusalem and they're not sure if he came out where there was the water spring or they don't know if he came out where there was the reservoir, but he got into the city. And as he got into the city, he was then able to open up the gates. And all we know is that the children of Israel and David's troops went in and they conquered the fortress. They conquered Jerusalem. They got to ride in and 
rush in in order to find that the city of peace would begin to be God's people and shout glory to God. And he did it through a, what I'm calling a tunnel vision. So now that we can go on, it says, let's look at, um, now that we read that, let's, let's jump down to verse nine. So David made the fortress his home and he called the city of David. He extended the city, starting at the supporting terraces and working inward. All we want to know is that David extended Jerusalem, which also included the surrounding hills and territories. You can read the rest of that particular section. Um, perhaps you want to see that Jerusalem means the teaching of peace. He now was all of united of Judah and Israel kingdom. But let's go ahead and jump down where it says how Jerusalem conquered is how Jesus conquers strongholds today as like time begins to close. I want you to to catch this thought. You know, when it came to conquering the promised land, the people of the children of Israel, they had to walk around Jericho and then shout and the walls came tumbling down. Here it is now, another promised land, the promised city, or you can say the promises of the peace of the kingdom. And they had to deal with walls again. And when the Jebusites, remember I said that they were taunting them, is because they knew that the city was so fortified that they could not get in over the wall. You see, there are things that some of us, we're trying to conquer in our lives and we're trying to climb up over it. We're trying to get over it. We're trying to rush in. We're trying to do it by our own might. We're trying to get in and be, you know, righteous on our own strength. We're trying to live right so that we can please everybody around us. And we fall short of that. And we may find ourselves in things that are bound in our lives because we're trying to mutate or adapt to things that we never can live in freedom in. But I say to you, how David caused them to conquer the city is the same way how Jesus conquers strongholds today. You see, Jesus Christ is the son of God, the son of man and the son of David. In other words, he is our anointed one who anoints us. The word Jerusalem is peace. And that is the peace has to be conquered in our lives. The promise of total shalom. I'm talking about when I say total shalom, I mean soundness in our lives to be well, to have physical healthiness, to have prosperity of the soul, to have a quiet, tranquil and contentment about us, to have friendships with human relationships, to be able to have a covenant with God and to be able to be absolute free from war internally and free from war externally with other people. We need to conquer it. I say it's part of who we are and it's part of the kingdom of God. And then the Jebusites, they represent our enemy, the spirits that cause hindering and bound in captivity. And those things, I call them pressions, like oppression and depression and suppression, depressions and the devil's demise. When I talk about what is the devil's demise, you know, we talked about the threshing floor. I want to remind you of Luke chapter 22, what Jesus shared with Simon Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. One pastor preached it this way, and I think it's beautiful and adequate to explain it today. He says, the devil wants to sift you like wheat. Or there was no, you know, there wasn't wheat, but to sift you like grain. You know what? That's not how you sift. You sift the rest of the things. You sift the part that you don't want. You sift the little pebbles. You sift off the access and you leave the value stuff there. And the devil says, I wanted us. He wants to sift us like wheat. 
In other words, the devil doesn't even know a value that you and I have in the kingdom of God and on earth and that we're bringing and showing and revealing heaven what it's like here. In other words, he's sifting the wrong thing because he doesn't even know what our value is. All I'm trying to get us all to know is you are valuable to God. He paid for us with a perfect price of his own life for our life so that we wouldn't have to pay for any penalties because he paid them all for us. He were, We were bought with a price of his life and we're valuable to God. How much more was his son valued? It's the price that he paid for our lives. Glory to Jesus. So the Jebusites, the word Jebusite means threshing floor and the devil, our enemy, doesn't even know how to use it. And then it says strongholds, strongholds, say strongholds. In other words, strongholds are long standing. This whole message is revolved around this thought. I've got to hurry. Strongholds, long standing, too long and so long, defeated and depleted, learned helplessness and hopelessness. If you want to know about strongholds, the word strongholds, for instance, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this word stronghold, at least in the Greek, in the old ancient Greek, it started out as mean a fort. A fort is something that you keep people out of. A fort is something you keep people out of. But as time continued, this word evolved into a word that did not mean fort, but it also meant something you keep things in, like a prison. What am I trying to say, people of God, with a panted heart, and a caring shepherd's heart is that Jesus wants us to know that when we are entrapped in strongholds, if we are dealing with strongholds, it started out where we tried to keep people out of our lives. We tried to not let people know what's going on with us with little secret thoughts and hiding and dipping and dodging and shady. But that's because we were not knowing how to have relationships and breakups all the time. Oh, my God. And that's keeping people out. But over time, so many people have stayed out that now we feel enclosed in where we find ourselves suppressed, oppressed, depressed, quieted, hiding, ashamed, dealing with guilt alone, feeling lonely and down. I'm saying that because of strongholds, we're keeping people out of our lives. We're sometimes keeping God out of our lives and we're trying to keep ourselves in and holding on. We were never meant to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone, but we need each other. That's what it is meant to be by the body of Christ. We were designed to be a kingdom, a community and a citizens of people. All of us would be one as Jesus played and prayed in John 17 that we might all be one even as he is one with the Father. We are meant to be one as well. Oh glory to God. Help me Lord Jesus to get over myself that I can break down these walls of strongholds in Jesus name. Thank you God. Look what the enemy does, taunts us, mocks us. There is an enemy that's making fun of us, accusing us to God, accusing us to ourselves, accusing us on TV and accusing us in newspapers and accusing us, even the internal enemy in a me. You see, we have need of repentance. We have need of freedom. We have need of humbling ourselves. The Bible, when it speaks about humbling, it says, humble yourselves. We have need of surrendering to Jesus, the anointed Savior in Sozo. And that's so we would be saved. And even though we save, we've got areas that need to be healed. And even though we're on our way and walking and healing, God needs to deliver us from some things. Oh, hear what I'm saying. You see, now I'm telling you what the message is. Just as David said, Take the tunnel to take the city. 
the place of promise, what belongs to God and his people. Jesus is not saying for us to go up over the wall, over the stronghold, but Jesus put in us a water spring, the rivers of living water, which is in us. And now he conquers our strongholds, our captivities, the bondages we deal with. He does it from the inside out because he moved in in John chapter 14, where me and my father, we will come and make our abode, our inhabitant, our residence on the inside of you. And we have now living on the inside. And now that spring of living water, John chapter four. And now we'll read John chapter seven, where it talks about the rivers of living water. It says, John seven thirty eight. he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But I want to remind you what we celebrated last week. Jesus did go to the cross. He was crucified. Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, early that Sunday morning, we celebrated that Jesus Christ came out, raised from the dead. He's the resurrected one. He has risen and now he has been glorified. And now that he's been glorified, now he has put on the inside of us a vision of how we conquer strongholds. Being bound and chained up is through a vision of total vision, straightforward, narrow, get down to the nitty gritty and may we be found free. Glory to God. I say to you, family of faith, guests from around the world, this is God's anointed tunnel vision for deliverance. Now we've come to the end of second Samuel five sixteen. Now we might understand a little bit more clearer after David was anointed and he conquers Jerusalem or the city of peace. And now he realizes that God's done great and mighty things for him. He names those three sons, Elishama, Eliad, and Eliphelet, which means what? God has heard or God hears. God knows and God delivers. That's what I want us to know today for those that have been in something way too long. I don't care if it's been for 30 years. I don't care if you broke up with somebody for 10 years and it still hurts. It doesn't matter if you know what you are in a situation that you have tried everything on the market, been to every conference, you've been to every altar, you've sent in all kinds of donations, and you're still stuck. I want you to know it's because God himself is still the deliverer, and he wants you delivered today. After David conquers Jerusalem, after years of the children of Israel, at least 300, they never had it in their possession. They finally miraculously win the victory and David transitions and has sons and daughters in his remembrance. And he goes to and testifies and prophesies their name to mean God has heard me. God knows what we've been through. And now God, he delivered it into my hands. I want to go into a time of ministry for those as we close where we pray for God's unexpected encounters to deliver whoever from long standing. This was not planned, not by man, but by God. I looked at the lyrics of that song and I saw it say from bondage and from chains. And you see it on your notes right there. I'm telling you, this was not synchronized by planning except God's purpose and plan that Jesus wants us delivered from bondage and chains. Oh, I know you're doing well and blessed in seven of the areas of seven of 10 areas of your life, but we want to come after those three, those three right now. I want to pray for marriages that are vacant of love and care. Things that you feel empty in and this has been too long. I'm talking about some of you all have been in marriage for years, sometimes months, and you're in it now for obligation 
or an emptiness of looking for a way out. It's just been so hurting. I had a word of the Lord. And please call in or write us. Do something to let us know. This is very specific. I saw a lady with a yellow top in the spirit. And on, on your back, there's a knot or a bump or a scar. And Jesus wants to sozo you and heal that. And it's been maybe a little pain, even something to sleep on or hard to touch. And it, it makes you scout our. I want you to know that those that have strongholds of secret sexual sins, unclear spirit, unclean spirits have entered in. And it's too embarrassing to admit it in order to be free. I am pleading with you today. You don't have to walk around in that stronghold any longer. Jesus made me free. And after I've been free, I've been free indeed ever since. And you too can be learned hopelessness, learn helplessness. You felt taunted, mocked, and you've bought into pulling it down on yourself as well. I believe that that was given for someone that has come to the place of hopelessness. And it's been long settled. Like, I mean, that cement has turned into concrete now. It's time to break open the fallow ground and the loss of a loved one. You feel like your their life was shortened. You felt like it was taken and may or may not have been from COVID-19. But you feel like that family and that loved one has life has been taken. Family of God. Jesus Christ conquers the city of our lives, the temple, just as he did when David took Jerusalem, the place of peace. I'm asking now, Jesus, in the name that you gave us, you said that if we ask anything of the Father, it would be given to us. And I speak to my brother and I speak to my sister that has things that have been bound and chained. And I'm praying they would snap off right now. I pray that even for some, wherever you are, that you even heard a clinging, that it fell to the ground. I ask that Jesus would show you that he hears you, that he knows what you've been struggling with. And today, he delivers you. It's in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name. Ta-ta. Hallelujah.